Good morning, Morgan Baptist Church and other friends tuning in this Lord's Day, April 5th on Palm Sunday. We're so excited to have you join us in this time of worship, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do today as we sing songs of praise, as we study scripture, and as we dive into God's word as we continue our study of the book of Hebrews. And so I thank you all for tuning in. Um, there's a lot of other things going on right now in this season of life, this crazy season of life. And I just invite you guys to hit pause, to um, set aside some of the distractions that are going on right now, and to just worship our Lord, our Savior, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, um, to, to just give him uh, this time to rid ourselves of distractions and worship together, even though we might not physically be together, to worship together during this time. Our songs and our message this morning are all centered on the cross, what Jesus Christ has done for sinners like yourself and myself. And so our three songs that we're going to open up with this morning are The Wonderful Cross, Worthy is the Lamb, and The Power of the Cross. And the reason that uh, we, we chose these songs mainly is because they, they all focus on what Jesus did for us. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And then Jesus came down, he put on human flesh, he lived a perfect life, and then he died on the cross. He died in our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so we celebrate the cross today because the cross is powerful. And so if you have a copy of the 2008 Baptist hymnal, um, all three of these songs are in that hymnal. And so I invite you guys to open that up and be able to uh, worship out of there. If you do not have a copy of the 08 Baptist Hymnal, then the lyrics are attached to this link. And so if you have another device available, you can go on to our Facebook link here and click the lyrics for these songs so that you're able to follow along, worship along. And I just pray that this is the cry out of your heart this morning, the power of the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time. Thank you that we have the opportunity to gather, even though we're not gathering physically, we are gathering spiritually as brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, thank you for this time. I just ask during this time that we will worship you in spirit and in truth, that any and all distractions will just uh, leave immediately, that we will be able to uh, just focus. Uh, we would pay attention to your word that we would lift up a joyful noise from our heart as we worship you, as we sing songs of praise to you, Father. Thank you for this time. God, I ask a special blessing on each and every person tuning in. Um, just continue to guide us and keep us safe during this season of uncertainty. And as we're going to look at today, Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the hope that we find in the cross. And thank you for the great news of salvation that we have to share with the world around us because of what Jesus did for us as he took our place and as he bore the punishment of God, the punishment of our sins before a holy God. So we thank you, we love you, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Romans 5, 8-9 through 9 say, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since then, or since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And we know as Christians that because of this, the cross is a great thing because God took the punishment for us so that we didn't have to. And so even though the world might see the cross as a bad thing, we see it as a wonderful thing. So please join us in worship as we sing the wonderful cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count by. 
It's a relatively new song, I guess you could say. It's uh, written by Keith Getty and Stuart Townend, um, two of the more popular uh, contemporary hymn writers in Christianity. Uh, I encourage you guys, after we get done with our worship service today, if you haven't heard of them before, to go ahead and Google uh, both of these individuals, Keith Getty and Stuart Townend, because they write some incredibly uh, scripturally sound modern hymns, and this certainly is one of them, entitled The Power of the Cross. And I just want to share the chorus with you guys. This is the last chorus. It says this, this the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. See, a lot of times, as we're going to talk about in our sermon in just a little bit, Whenever we look at salvation, we look at what Jesus did, and we say, oh, salvation is free. And salvation is free in the sense that we don't work for it. We could never measure up and earn our way. But salvation came with a cost. And this song reminds us that the cost was that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, had to die. And so salvation came with a cost. And while the rest of the world might see the cross as weakness, we see the power of of the cross in that Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life so that sinners like you and I could be reconciled to God. That's the type of God we serve. That is our Messiah. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So sing this out, the power of the cross.
is crushed to death. Life is mine to live. Walk through your selfless love. This the power of the cross. Son of God, slain for us. What a love. pray that you stand forgiven at the cross today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, once again, we pause and we thank you. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross some 2,000 years ago. Father, as the story continues, though, we thank you that you didn't just stay dead, but that as we're going to celebrate a week from now on Easter Sunday, that you defeated death, that death was arrested. Father, thank you for that hope, that joy, that even in extremely difficult times like we are living in now, we have hope, we have joy that the rest of the world knows nothing about. So Father, during this time, I pray that you would speak, that your spirit would speak through me as we look through Hebrews 2, 5, through nine, as we see that Jesus' death on the cross is where our life begins because Jesus didn't just die and suffer, but that Jesus was also raised and that in defeating death, he was glorified and exalted. And Father, that's the hope we have today as well, that if we are in Christ, that we have the hope of eternal glory awaiting us. And so Father, be with us in this time, rid us of distractions and help us to apply this word, this passage of scripture into our lives today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Last week, we continued our study of the book of Hebrews, and we looked at Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, and saw how the preacher of Hebrews argues that we must pay attention to the message of Jesus Christ. We must pay attention, and we must not drift away, as Hebrews 2, 1 tells us. Because if we do drift away, if we do reject this message of salvation, Hebrews 2, 3 reminds us, how then shall we escape if we ignore, if we neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 is a wonderful passage of scripture. It's a warning passage, though. On the one hand, it's bad news. If you reject the message of Jesus Christ, if you reject the victory that Jesus has purchased on the cross of Calvary, if you reject that, there is punishment awaiting you. Jesus himself said that he is the only way to salvation. He is the only way to the Father. And so on the one hand, this is a warning passage. It's a bad thing if you reject Jesus' sacrifice. But if you accept it, if you are in Christ today, this is a wonderful passage of Scripture that gives you boldness. It gives you confidence and assurance that you are in Christ today. Jesus, as Paul says in Romans 8, verse 1. And so if you are in Christ Jesus today, I beg of you, do not drift. Don't drift away from his message. Pay attention, not just literally to the sermon message, not just literally to the song service, but pay attention to the Holy Spirit inside of you. Follow the Holy Spirit every step of the way and pay attention to what Scripture tells us. As Christians, we talk a lot about salvation. But we use this word salvation, and salvation is a wonderful word because we know that we were lost. We were dead, as Paul says in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. So things don't look very good, but then Jesus, through his death on the cross, by taking the punishment that we deserve, there is salvation through Jesus 
Christ. And so salvation is an awesome, awesome term that we need to share with others. But one of the ways that salvation can be described and that I've heard it used is people say salvation is free. Like I mentioned just a couple of moments ago, that salvation is free. And, and I understand where these people come from. They're saying that we cannot earn our own way and that Jesus earned it for us. Jesus's work of atonement on the cross paid the price. Therefore, the price for us is nothing. It's free because it's already been paid. And certainly that is true. We do not work for our salvation. Jesus worked for it 2,000 years ago on the cross. And as Hebrews 10 reminds us, his work of atonement is done. In one sacrifice for all time, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So praise God that salvation is free in that sense. But think for a moment back to a time in your life where you worked really hard for something. Maybe for some of you, you were saving up for a car when you turned 16. You worked months and months and months leading up to this point so that whenever you got your license, you could go out and buy a car. Maybe for others of you, you saved up a lot of money in order to be able to purchase a video game console, an Xbox, a PlayStation, or the new Nintendo Switch. Maybe you just wanted to purchase a game for one of these things that was expensive. And so you had to work really hard to save up money. For others, maybe it was a concert. Maybe it was a big sporting event. And you worked really hard, and then finally you had enough money to be able to purchase that thing. And as we've all been told by our parents, that is the value of hard work, right? Working really hard and finally getting to the point where, boom, you can afford that thing. Your hard work paid off. And there's a sweet feeling whenever you work hard and you're able to enjoy the, the fruit of your hard work. There's other times in life, though, where we're given things for free. Maybe you live in a family that's very large. Maybe you have older brothers and sisters. Maybe uh, you just have good friends who share clothes. And maybe you've had a set of hand-me-down jeans that has been passed on from sibling to sibling to sibling, and now you are the fourth person to wear these jeans. They were freely given to you, and maybe you like the jeans. Maybe you value the jeans in a sense because you know that they at one time were really expensive or that someone else paid for them and that you should take care of them because of that. But things feel differently if they're given to us versus if we work hard for them ourselves. And one of the reasons I, I feel like in talking with individuals that we wrestle with salvation so much is because we think that salvation is something we have to work for, something that we have to do a lot of preparation for, and then if we work hard enough, then we can be saved because we have done the work. But friends, that's not how it is. Salvation is free in the sense that Jesus in his work of atonement on the cross of Calvary has paid the penalty of your sins for all time. Jesus on the cross, if you are in Christ Jesus, he paid the debt that you owe. And so in that sense, salvation is certainly free. But sometimes, again, in the sense, we say it's freely offered, and we leave it at that. We just say salvation is free, and we don't talk about it anymore. But we have to understand that it, it's not just free, because salvation came at a cost, and the cost was the life of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity who was present at creation, who spoke things into existence, the same Jesus who was lowered at the incarnation, the same Jesus who humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, as Paul notes in Philippians chapter 2. Friends, we must never minimize what Jesus did for us on the cross. We must never buy into the lie that we deserve that on our own because we're pretty good, like so many people say. We have to remember what Scripture says. Scripture says we are sinners. And that's not a popular message right now, but it's what the Bible says. We're sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. And in and of ourselves, from a legal standpoint, we deserve punishment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible also says all have sinned. Therefore, we all deserve death and destruction and separation from God. But then Jesus came in and Jesus took the penalty upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for 
us. Friends, he gave us what we did not deserve. And he took upon himself what we did deserve. Salvation is not just free, friends. We have to remember that salvation cost Jesus his life. We have to look at the cross in that lens. And so our text this morning out of Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 9, reminds us that Jesus is in control. That Jesus is superior to the angels. He is exalted because he suffered and he died. As the song says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. But what did Jesus do 2,000 years ago? He washed it white as snow. And so friends tuning in, I pray that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you can honestly say, I, I am a sinner. I mess up. But man, Jesus washes me white as snow. And if not, guess what? Today can be your day of salvation. You can have that hope, that blessed assurance today. And that hope is only offered through Jesus Christ. Let's read this text out of Hebrews 2, starting in verse 5. The Bible says, For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere, saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Friends, I love that last line because Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. He tasted death for everyone by the grace of God. There is hope, there is salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. Only Jesus could accomplish this great, wondrous salvation. And so our outline today starts out with a very similar theme throughout Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, that Jesus is superior to angels. And then we see a, a passage that quotes Psalm chapter 8, in which we see that Jesus was briefly lower. He was made lower than the angels, but then Jesus was crowned. He was exalted as well. The preacher of Hebrews in verse 5 starts out by saying, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come. That's a little confusing for us to, to understand. What on earth does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is superior to the angels. And if we look to the, the coming verses, verses 6 through 8, they quote Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, by showing us that mankind has dominion over the world. We were created in order to rule this world world. Psalm 8 says this, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him for a little while lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty and you make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Verse 5 or verse 6 of Hebrews says that this was for a little while. The, the Son of Man was made a little while lower than the angels. Psalm 8, 5 says, You have made man lower than God. The words are flipped around just a little bit, but the preacher is quoting this passage of Scripture from Psalm 8. And in reading this passage, we think of some songs that come to our head, right? About who are we? There's one song that came out by Casting Crowns, the Christian group, that is entitled, Who Am I? And I love this song because it says, Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wondering heart? Friends, it's not about us. It's not about us because we are so insignificant. We are sinners. We fall short every single day. There's nothing inside of us that, that, that is like, boom, God, God sees us and goes, wow, that person's perfect. 
that person's great. I'm going to send Jesus Christ to die for them. Because if you were perfect, guess what? You don't need Jesus. The reason we all need Jesus is because of Romans 3.23. All have sinned. We are sinners. We are insignificant in and of ourselves. But we also see time and time again in Scripture that we are loved by our Savior, by our Maker, and by our Creator. We are loved. We are known intimately by the King of Kings. Psalm chapter 8 is a psalm by David. And David looks back to Adam and the biblical truths that are found in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This psalm states the fact that mankind is lower than God. We are lower than God. Yet, mankind is made, we are created to exercise dominion. We are created to rule this planet, which is God's creation. We see the theme of ruling, the theme of leadership found throughout the Old Testament. And eventually, Hebrews, the preacher of Hebrews comes around, and in Hebrews chapter 2, he quotes back to Psalm 8 to say, Jesus Christ is that leader. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Davidic king that was promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 in the Davidic kingdom covenant. Jesus is that guy who is going to sit upon the throne of David forever and ever as Isaiah chapter 9 reminds us. Sometimes we know in our modern culture, in movies, TV shows, that angels can be depicted as warriors. Maybe angels can be depicted as wonderful helpers that sit on our shoulder and whisper positive, encouraging, and uplifting thoughts into our ear. That's what angels are depicted of more times than not, And I have heard some people say the following. I wish I was an angel. It would be so cool to be an angel because I could be a member of the heavenly host. I could be a messenger of God. And I understand the thought. I understand what they're getting at. It would be cool to be a member of the heavenly host right now. It would be cool to be a messenger of God. But as Hebrews 2.5 reminds us, it is not the angels that he has subjected the world to come that's not where it's at. Jesus came. He didn't become an angel. Jesus put on human flesh. And in putting on human flesh, God entrusted the new covenant to Jesus Christ. As Jeremiah 31, 33 said, there is a covenant that will not be written on tablets of stone, but instead it will be written upon the people's hearts and upon their mind. That message is brought about not by angels, but through Jesus Christ. Jesus is superior. Our songs focused on the cross because the cross is key in remembering who Jesus is and what his mission was. Some people are confused as to what Jesus really did. Why did Jesus have to come? What if Jesus was just born? Couldn't he have done everything he did just by humbling himself in the incarnation and doing miracles and doing lots of exciting, cool things? things like that. Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus died in order to satisfy the wrath of God, in order to fulfill the punishment of our sins, because our sins deserve punishment. And God's justice requires that a punishment be made, a sacrifice be made, and only God can fulfill that role. And so Jesus humbled himself, he put on human flesh. He became obedient to death on a cross. In our world, whenever people suffer, sometimes we're confused. We're thinking, why did that person suffer and not that person? And medically speaking, some of the reasons that people suffer is because the person has a weakness. Maybe they're a little bit older. Maybe they have a, another underlying condition that makes them more susceptible to getting sick, to getting a virus such as COVID-19 right now. Maybe that's why people get sick because they're weak. They have an illness. Maybe they're old. On the other hand, maybe people get sick. Maybe there's a punishment. Maybe they suffer because they made a bad choice. For example, if you go into Walmart right now and you get your cart and you don't sanitize it and someone else who was sick was pushing your cart and you pick up that cart and you proceed to go ahead and stick your finger in your mouth and touch your eyes and nose and everything else, that's not a good choice. I think we can all agree with that fact. And because of that, you might suffer as a result of your poor decision. Jesus, though, his death 
on the cross was not an act of weakness. It was not a bad choice. Rather, Jesus in his death demonstrates his strength because he suffers. Temporal suffering leads to eternal glory. We know that fact by following Jesus because Jesus suffered. He suffered greatly and deeply, but Jesus didn't just stay dead after he died. Jesus rose. Jesus is glorified. He is exalted. He is at the right hand of the Father right now. And Jesus told his followers, in this world you will suffer, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And so friends, right now we're going to suffer. Maybe not physically, maybe not with the illness, but some people are going to suffer economically. Some people are going to suffer relationally because maybe for the first time in years, you're stuck at home with your spouse and you have nowhere else to go. And so maybe that's how, how things are going to be a little uneasy over the next couple of weeks ahead. We are all going to suffer in some form, some fashion during this time ahead. But friends, be of good cheer because just because we're suffering, it doesn't mean that God is displeased with us. It doesn't mean that we are weak. Instead, it proves the fact that we have eternal glory awaiting us because just as Jesus suffered, we will suffer. Jesus didn't just suffer, though. Jesus was raised and glorified. We have that resurrection hope as well in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is superior to the angels for three reasons so far in Hebrews 1 and 2. First, Jesus is divine. He is not a created <coughs> messenger. Jesus is divine. He is the eternal son of God. And so that makes him superior. Again, Jesus is the creator. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus was there at creation. He created. He was not a created being like the angels. Third, he brings about a superior message. He brings about a new covenant that is something that the angels could never bring about. Hebrews 2.5 shows us that Jesus is also superior because of the incarnation, which leads us to our second point, that Jesus is briefly lowered. Some people are kind of confused about the incarnation. Some people say that Jesus was 100% divine, and then at the moment of the incarnation, he left aside his privileged status, he left aside his heavenly position, he left aside all of his deity, and became 100% man. Other people don't go that far. They say Jesus was 100% divine, but at the incarnation, he became 50-50. Half God, half man, one Jesus. That's not the, script, the, the painting that Scripture gives us, though. Scripture shows us that Jesus was still fully God, and he was also fully man. That doesn't make sense in our human minds, 100% and 100% because we're thinking if you're very logical like myself, if you have a glass that is full to the brim of water and you get a perfectly similar glass also filled to the brim with water and you pour it on top of the first glass, what's that water going to do? It's not going to magically keep on going on top of it, right? No, it's going to spill over and you're going to have a mess to clean up. So whenever we think of 100% and 100%, we think they come together and make 200%, but that's not Jesus. Jesus, fully God, fully man, boom, in one person, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. That is the picture given to us in Scripture. Jesus was still fully God. Jesus became fully man. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He cried. He grieved, and he even died. For a time, he was lower than the angels whenever he walked on this planet. Psalm chapter 8 reminds us, though, we are created in the image of God. Isn't that incredible? That's one of the greatest pieces of hope. That's one of the biggest blessings that we have as human beings, that we are superior to all other aspects of creation simply by being created in the image of God. Of God, and we were given the job to rule over creation in the garden. But what happened in the garden? Mankind sinned. We messed up. We dropped the ball. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Why? 
because all sinned. And maybe you're at home thinking that doesn't make a lick of sense because you're saying that through one man's sin, all are sinners. Yes, that is the, that is the story that is in Scripture that Adam, you can look at this in a couple of ways, but one way looks at this as though literally Adam is our common ancestor. We all trace our genealogy back to Adam. Therefore, because of that fact, genetically speaking, we were all in Adam. Therefore, whenever Adam sinned and whenever Adam had kids, we all had the common ancestor. Therefore, Adam was a sinner. All of his descendants are sinners too. Other people look at it differently. They say Adam is our representative head. He is humans, uh, the mankind's representative, just as Jesus is your representative if you are a Christian. Therefore, as humans, Adam sinned. Adam is our representative head. Therefore, we are all sinners. And it follows that Jesus Christ, because he is our representative head as Christians, he saves us. Not because of what we've done, but because Jesus did that for us. Through the sin of Adam, all have sinned. Death spreads to all mankind. In Genesis 3, the heading on uh, in your copy of God's word is going to say something like the fall of man, the fall. We messed up. We fell short. And a lot of people blame Adam and Eve for this. I've heard numerous people say something along these lines. They say, man, if Adam and Eve only hadn't sinned, if Eve hadn't have eaten that apple, if Adam had just been a better leader, if he had just done a better job, then we wouldn't be experiencing all of this bad stuff today. Really? That's the position that you want to make? You don't think that over the next, I don't know, six, seven thousand years that no one else would have sinned? Really? You have that high of an expectation and reality of mankind. No, this was going to happen. We were going to sin. But even though we messed up, even though we are sinners, even though we are separated from God because of our sin, we see that God still remembers us. He still cares for us. If God, the maker of the universe, cares for his children, if he loves us, if we are created in his image, then shouldn't we love others as well? If for no other reason than the fact that their life is valuable because they are created in the image of God just as we are. We should, friends. We should love others. And some of you all might be getting a little cranky. Maybe you're getting cranky with the whole social distancing stuff. You're thinking, oh, this has gone on for three weeks. And now it's going to be going on for another three weeks. And the governor on TV on Friday said it might go on even longer than that. I'm done. This is terrible. Maybe that's where you're at with this issue. Maybe you're on the other hand, you're thinking, this is the end of the world. I don't know how we're going to get through this. Regardless of where you fall on this spectrum, maybe you think it's serious. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just wondering, is this even a big deal? I don't know anyone who's suffering. Friends, I want to share with you, one of my best friends is suffering from this illness right now. He's suffering physically speaking. Many of you all know people who are suffering economically speaking because of this illness, because of the devastating impact it is making not just upon our nation, but around the globe. And friends, as Christians, we have a responsibility to look out for others, to care for others, just as God remembers and cares for us, we do a great job of making sure that people know that the unborn lives in our world matter. We do a great job of caring about life in the womb. But friends, life matters from the womb to the tomb. And last I checked, people who are sick right now, people who are suffering because of this illness, their life matters too. And some of the most unloving posts the most unloving statements I have heard about this whole pandemic have come from who? They've come from Christians. And friends, that can't be the case. That can't be the case because we were bought with a price. The life of Jesus Christ. And we're not called to sit back and say this is a hoax when people are dying. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're called to love others, to care for others. And friends, that includes us looking out for the well-being, the safety of others, our friends, our grandparents, people who are pregnant, 
people who are diabetic, people who are suffering. We have to look out for others. The awesome thing that we see with Jesus is that Jesus was made lower than the angels for a little while, according to Hebrews 2, 7, and he was crowned. He was given glory and honor. The preacher cites Psalm 8, 5 here and emphasizes that Jesus restores humanity as the God-man, as only Jesus could do. Jesus Christ, during the incarnation, put upon human flesh. He was tempted just like you and I. Listen to Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Can you imagine that? C can you imagine that? That part is so crucial. Jesus understands. Jesus knows. Jesus loves. He understands what you're going through right now. He was tempted too, but he didn't sin. And maybe you're thinking, you know what? I can go one whole day without sin too. I'm locked in my home. I, I can choose to do enough right actions. Um, I, I can read scripture. I can do my schoolwork. I can do my work for my job all at home. And I can go one day without sinning with my actions. I guess so. It, knock yourself out if that's you. That's great. But scripture says that it's not just with our actions. Listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Not might be guilty before the court, but shall be guilty before the court. First John 3 reminds us that simply being angry at someone, hating someone, means that we are at serious fault. First John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So, so friends, pause what you're doing right now and ask yourself, do I have hatred in my heart? Do I hate a brother and sister because of something they believe? Do I hate a brother or sister in Christ because of something that they've done wrong to me? Take it even broader. Do I hate this non-Christian for what they think? Do I hate this non-Christian for what they've done to me? Now, Paul talks in the book of Ephesians about how hatred, anger is not always a sin. There are some times where you can be filled with righteous anger. So not every time being angry is a bad thing, but most of the time it is. I think we can all agree with that. Most of the time when we're angry, we're angry and it's sin. And so ask yourself right now, friends, am I sinning? Not with my action right now, but because I've got this grudge. I've got this built up volcano of hatred directed at this person because of what they did or what they think. And I hate them. And ask God, to create in you a new heart, to forgive you, and to allow you to let that anger go. Because there's nothing sweeter, there's nothing sweeter than reconciliation in the church of Jesus Christ. We are sinners. We have a fallen nature. We all sin. And friends, the reason why is because oftentimes we just do what we want to do. We just do whatever we think we should do. And sadly, our thoughts don't always line up with God's thoughts. Isaiah says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, declares the Lord. And friends, our plan doesn't always line up with God's plan. We mess up, but Jesus doesn't. We sin, but Jesus, according to Hebrews 4.15, was without sin. And Jesus now is crowned with glory glory. In honor, he lived a perfect life and he died the death that you and I deserve. And friends, we rejoice in the cross of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was just an angel, if Jesus had become an angel, then he could only redeem angels. But that's not who Jesus was. Jesus in the incarnation put upon human flesh. He who knew no sin became sin for us. 
he had to assume what he was going to say. And because Jesus put on human flesh, because he was lowered at the incarnation, he can and he does redeem and reconcile sinners like you and I to a holy God. That's the power of Jesus that he displayed in dying. Because Jesus defeated death by dying. That's a big God. That's a really big God who defeats the power of sin and death by dying. That's the God that we serve. And our world sees death as weakness. Our world sees suffering as weakness. But Christ subverts that idea. He reverses that idea by showing that instead, this is his strength. This is his power as he voluntarily sacrificed his life so that we could be saved. That is the gift of Jesus Christ. That is salvation that is offered only through Jesus. That's the Jesus that we praise. That's the Jesus that we know. I ask you, do you know Jesus? Are you in Jesus Christ? Do you have that relationship? Have you experienced the grace that can only come from Jesus? I pray that you do. I pray that you know him. Are you experiencing difficulty right now? Are you suffering? Are you going through a rough patch of life? Many people are. Many people are having to do things differently. And that can cause problems and issues to rise up. We, we have a change of scenery. Uh, Governor Parson announced a couple of days ago that now we have a stay-at-home order in the state of Missouri. And if you're tuning in from other states, praise God. Hello. I don't know where you're tuning in from, but maybe your state has the same thing. And because of that, that can cause some stress to come about. That can cause stress because you're having to work from home. If you have kids, your, your kids are having to do school from home. And we just have so much stress on ourselves right now. And maybe there's just so much on your mind and you're struggling. I'm right there with you. Uh, I'm there with you. But even better than that, better than your pastor being there with you, Jesus is there with you. Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus cares for you. Jesus loves you. And maybe... You think you're in this all by yourself. Maybe you think that no one else cares that I'm in this battle by myself. Don't buy into that lie. Jesus knows. Jesus loves you. Jesus knows you. He created you. Read Hebrews 2 verse 18 and be encouraged because Jesus Christ comes to the aid of all who are tempted Jesus experienced suffering and sin at its worst because we see no greater example of humility and suffer and serving and love than Jesus Christ coming to this earth he left behind his privileged status as the eternal son he came to earth still fully God still fully man but he left behind his divine rights and he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross Friends, Jesus humbled himself. He serves, he loves, and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so while our world runs to all sorts of other alternatives, while our world says, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that, remind him, no, we need Jesus. We need to run to Jesus whose arms are open wide. Run to Jesus today. Do not neglect so great a salvation because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The cross is the essential doctrine upon which everything turns and without which you cannot understand the argument of the gospel. If you get the cross wrong, you get Christianity wrong. The idea behind the cross, the cross, the cross is the theme of scripture. There are many passages of scripture. There are many songs such as the ones we sung this morning that talk about the cross. And we know, as Paul notes, and as we see in Deuteronomy, that the cross is thought to have been a curse. Deuteronomy says, Cursed is every man who hangs upon a tree. The Jews didn't understand the cross. They said Jesus can't be the Messiah because Jesus died on a cross. Therefore, Jesus is not the Messiah, not the Son. Rather, Jesus is cursed by God. The Gentiles didn't understand the cross. Paul says the cross is a stumbling block. But if you're a Christian today, 
You understand the story of that old rugged cross. You understand that the death of Jesus as the Old Testament foreshadowed was coming. If you read Isaiah 52 and 53, the suffering servant passage, then you understand this is something that had to happen. Some people ask the question, why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did it have to be this way again? It had to be this way because God cannot look upon sin and just wipe the slate clean because humanity is pretty good. Pretty good is not good enough. As we noted last week, the standard according to the Bible is not pretty good. It's not a C. It's not a B. It's not an A. It's not even 99.9. .9. It's 100%. You have to be perfect. That's the standard according to Scripture. And if God just wipes the slate clean and there is no atonement for sin, then that violates his justice. Rather, Jesus' death on the cross was the only way to save sinners and also do justice to the perfection of God. It's the only way. Jesus and Jesus alone. See, we don't just need forgiveness. We don't just need to go to the doctor and have a surgery performed. We need a new nature. Because we're not just people who sin. We're sinners. As Paul says, the old has gone. Behold, the new has come. I pray that's your testimony today. I pray that you can look back and say, you know what? That was my old self. I used to do this stuff. I used to act this way. But now because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, because I have the Holy Spirit inside of my heart, I am a new creation. I look differently as Jesus says in John 3. I am born again. I am brand new. And friends, we have to always keep in mind this is not because we deserve it. Rather, it's because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. This is the great salvation that is talked about in Hebrews 2, verse 3. Jesus offers this freely. But again, we know that it was infinitely expensive as it cost him his life. In his suffering, though, we know that there is freedom, there is salvation, and God is glorified. Jesus' sacrifice, he is crowned, he is exalted as Paul notes in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. It's all about the glory of God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the, the local church even. It's all about glorifying our Father who art in heaven and Philippians 2 9 says Jesus is given the name that is above every name what name is that according to verse 11 that Jesus Christ is Lord he is Savior he fulfilled his messianic mission and he redeemed mankind he suffered he died again he who knew no sin became sin if you really want to get graphic the creator of the universe created the materials that were used to make the tools that the Romans and Jews tortured Jesus with. The same Jesus who created the universe is the same Jesus who created the tree by which the Romans chopped down in order to construct the wooden, the wooden cross that Jesus was hung upon. There is no greater example of humility than in Jesus' death on the cross. Just as Adam's sin spread to mankind, Jesus' gift of salvation spreads and is far more powerful, friends. Romans 5.15 But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Jesus' death on the cross undoes the curse. It reverses the curse. And Jesus exercises dominion over the universe. Because as we're going to look at next week, Jesus rendered powerless the devil. Jesus paid it all on that old rugged cross. Again, Christ defeats death. How? By dying. He defeats death on death's own terms, on death's turf, in death's backyard. 
Jesus says, no more. He defeats it. And if you're in Jesus, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Because there is life, there is Zoe in Jesus Christ, and only in him, death has no power over you today. You don't have to be afraid. That doesn't give you a license to be a fool. That doesn't give you a license to go out and make poor decisions. Rather, what it does mean is that if you are in Christ, you are deemed innocent, and in courtroom speech, you are perfect, not because of what we've done, not because of my works, not because of what your works are, because our works in and of ourselves are filthy rags, but instead of Jesus' work on the cross. Read Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 16. That shows you the power of Jesus' work. And whenever the Father sees you, he doesn't see white, black, gray, purple, blue. He sees red. He sees the blood of Jesus, and he credits your account with righteousness. So what a merciful and faithful high priest we serve. He tasted death for everyone, according to Hebrews 2, verse 9. So what does that mean? What does that look like? It means this. Jesus died. He suffered all of this so that you and I might become sons and daughters of God, so that we could be adopted into God's eternal family. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus, all of this is done in order to display the power of God, the power that God holds over sin and death. And all you have to do, all you have to do is believe, repent of your wrongdoing, pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ and the good, the bad, whatever life gives us, understand to know that God is in control. The same Jesus who created the universe the same Jesus Christ who created these angels. The same Jesus who was born in a manger nearly 2,000 years ago. The same Jesus who obeyed his sinful parents. The same Jesus who commanded his followers to leave their families behind and follow him. The same Jesus who wept whenever his friend died. The same Jesus who suffered the price on Calvary is the same Jesus who says, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. Because there is salvation in no other name under heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. And if you get that wrong, you're in trouble. So I beg of you, ask yourself, do I know Jesus? Do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because many people reject him. And I beg of you, do not reject Jesus today. Because we're all in a serious storm right now. We're all worried. We're all a little bit uncertain. But friends, there is a far more serious storm awaiting you. I don't know when that storm is going to hit you. But whenever you pass away, whenever your time on this earth is done, there is a reckoning. There is a wave of punishment that is going to fall upon you. And either Jesus takes that punishment for you or you take that punishment for yourself and you are condemned to an eternal separation from God. And that storm is far worse than the storm we're facing today. And so ask yourself, do you understand that this is how much Jesus loves you? That Jesus bore the punishment in full. He bore the wrath of God. He suffered the scourging, the flogging, the torture on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven and so you could experience a new birth, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3. What a joy we have in Jesus. I pray that you have that joy and hope as well. Three things for us as we close. First, just as Jesus displayed humility and love on the cross, we must be humble. We must love others around us as well. In the good times and in the bad times, we should serve others, be the hands and feet of Jesus, be charitable, be loving, give grace towards others. Second, Jesus won for us the victory. Even though we have worries and fears, we also have the hope of eternal glory. And so there's fears that we have right now. We have worries today. Maybe you're worried if you're still going to have your job a week from now. Maybe you're worried about your health 
or the health of a loved one. And it's fine to be a little concerned about those things. But friends, we have hope in Jesus. Jesus satisfies. Jesus saves. Third, people are searching for something to hold on to. We're coming up upon Easter. And I know that's hard to believe given all the things that are happening right now. But Easter's one week away. And we know that during Easter time, people are searching for something. They hear the story of Jesus raising from the dead. And some people are curious. They want to know more. And so friends, because of that, remind them of the greatest news of all, that Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Forty days after that, he ascended back on high where he is our high priest interceding on our behalf. Jesus saves sinners of which I am the greatest. Share that message with others today. If you don't have the relationship with Jesus Christ, why not? Truly, I ask you, why not? Why wait any longer? Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. If you have any business you need to do with Jesus, do that right now. Because today can be your day of salvation. Because Jesus is still in the business of saving lost souls and reconciling us to a holy God. Turn to Jesus today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this truth that there is salvation in Jesus Christ and that even though you died, even though you suffered, that you didn't stay dead, but that you rose and that you were exalted, you were crowned with glory and honor and that in you there is hope because we know there is something far greater awaiting us than just dead. And so, Father, help us to share that message with others, because the great news about Jesus' death on the cross is that it is good news for all the world. And so help us to share that message of hope during this season of chaos. Father, I pray for each and every person tuning in. I just ask a special blessing, a special hedge of protection during this time, that you'll keep everyone safe, that you will just bring us back uh, whenever it is that we're able to meet in person. And that, Father, during this time, we continue to make much of you. We share the good news of Jesus. And that in doing so, Father, it's my prayer that someone will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Because, Father, there's nothing greater in the whole wide world. There's nothing greater than seeing the light bulb come on in someone's life. Where finally Scripture clicks. Where they finally realize I am a sinner, but Jesus offers salvation. So, Father, I just ask, Father, please save someone. If that be your will, just convict hearts, open eyes. And, Father, let this be the day of salvation for someone. And, Father, for those of us who are already Christians, help us to continue to share this good news. Whether that means calling people who don't know you, checking in on neighbors, uh, sharing things on social media. Father, help us to be obedient to share the good news of Jesus during this season of chaos. We love you. We are so thankful for what you did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for that assurance that it gives us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for tuning in, each and every one of you all. Um, I just ask, I pray that this time was encouraging for you all, that uh, you were able to get something out of our song service and our study out of Hebrews chapter 2. Um, I want to close with just a couple words, um, primarily for our members here at Morgan Baptist Church. Um, the governor of Missouri, Mike Parson, and the president, President Trump, uh, issued um, stay-at-home orders. I guess Trump's was still the social distancing thing, but Parson issued a stay-at-home order for the state of Missouri on Friday, April 3rd, from April 6th until, I believe, uh, the end of April. And so um, what we have decided as a leadership body at Morgan Baptist Church is that we are canceling all in-person activities for the entire month of April. Um, and I know that th that's tough. Because we were really hoping to be able to come back this month. It's tough. But God is good. He is in control. And we're still doing church. We're still 
uh, having that relationship with each other in this time. And so I just invite you guys to continue to check in on one another, continue to call one another, um, love on one another. If you have any requests, prayer requests, announcements, if there's any needs that you have, call me, let me know, share that message with other people because we are going to get through this. We are going to get through this. There's going to be a day, I don't know when, when this is all in the past and we're gonna be able to come and gather and shake one another's hands and smile and it's gonna be a great day, but that day is not now. That day is not the next couple of weeks. And so for the month of April, we're not going to be gathering in person. We're still going to be streaming our services on Facebook and YouTube. We're going to have a, a Wednesday evening Bible study on Wednesdays. We're going to have scripture reading on Monday and Friday as well. And so stay active, stay plugged in on our Facebook page and share this good news of what Jesus has done with others. I love you guys. I'm praying for you guys. If there's anything I can do, let me know. If this is your first time ever tuning in, if this is the first time you've ever heard about Jesus Christ, please trust in Jesus today because today can be your day of salvation. And if you have any questions about that, shoot me a message. Let me know. I'd love nothing more than to be able to talk to you about that awesome, awesome news. See you guys later.